March 16, 2023 meeting of the Baltimore County Planning Board. It is now called to order, Howard. I'm Nancy Hafford, the chair of the board, and we will now start with the meeting with a roll call to account for all of our board members that are present. When you hear your name, please say aye. Mr. Avery. Aye. Ms. Brophy. Aye. Ms. German. Aye. Ms. Mr. Heffer. Aye. Mr. Heckman. Aye. Mr. Heinel. Mr. Hilton. Hinton, I'm sorry. I knew you were. Mr. Halipka. Aye. Mr. Johnson. Mr. McGinnis. Aye. Mr. Perlow. Aye. Ms. Panero. Mr. Warren. Aye. Ms. Ms. Wolfson. Aye. Thank you. Board members, please remember to mute your microphones because it throws off the audio when this is being recorded. And then turn it on when you're ready to speak. Before we recite the Pledge of Allegiance, I would like to officially welcome two of our new planning board members. Mr. Shafiq Hinton, welcome. Do you wanna share a little bit about yourself? So yeah, my name is Shafiq Hinton and lifelong resident of the county, live over in District 6 with Peter. So super excited to be on the, on the planning board and learn a little bit more about how we can help I move things forward here. I work in healthcare full time and also in real estate. So definitely looking to lean some of those expertise to help this illustrious crew. So thanks for having me. We're glad you're with us. And now I'd like to welcome Mr. Haffer. Hafer. 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 <laughs> Would you like to say a little bit about yourself? Sure, my name is Chris Hafer. I am in a, the seventh district representative. Uh, this is my second stint on the planning board. I was here about five years ago and left to take a um, senior executive service position at the US Equal Employment Opportunity Commission in DC. Before that, I spent 26 years at the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services doing all things data and analytics. I recently retired and when uh, con uh, Councilman Crandall heard that I was retiring. He immediately asked me if I wanted my position back on the planning board. So, so here I am. So it's nice to be back. Well, it's nice to have both of you join us. Thank you so much. And right now we'll recite the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge, pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Ms. Bensley, are there any changes to the tentative agenda as published? No changes, Madam Chair. Thank you so much. In the March 9, 2023 email, you received draft minutes from the March 2nd meeting. Has every, every, everyone had the opportunity to review the draft minutes? Are there any corrections? If not, May I entertain a motion to accept the minutes as circulated? Motion. Thank you. Second. Is it all in favor? Aye. Any opposed? If not, motion carries. First up this evening, we have an opportunity to further discuss and then vote on the landmark preservation park and recreation plans for 2022. The item was first introduced to the board on February 16th 2023 at a public hearing that was conducted on March 2nd, 2023. Staff of the Department of Recreation and Parks are here to answer any questions that the board may have as we discuss and we'll discuss before we vote. Mr. Bob Smith and Mr. Pat McDougall from the Department of Recreation and Parks, would you like it to add anything this evening? Good evening, Chairwoman Hafford and members of the board. We're just here tonight seeking a uh, approval of the LPPRP. I mean, we'll be here to answer any questions if you have any. Thank you. Board members, I open the floor. Do any of you have any questions or any discussion? Maybe. Uh, Bob, uh, will the uh, facility at uh, Hereford for the Senior Center 
Will that be large enough to accommodate some recreation uh, activity, the indoor facility? Uh, that facility will be a Department of Aging facility, so I couldn't speak to it, but we were going to work closely with aging and would hope to have a gymnasium space in that facility. What are future plans for the 30-acre site out on Middletown Road, which they've owned, the county has owned for some time now? I don't believe the county owns that site on Middletown Road. I think Road. so. The Recreation Council owns that site. Is there any plans in the future, near future, to use that site? Uh, the county doesn't have any plans because it's not property the county owns. Got it, Mr. McInnes? Any other questions? Hi, there's an entire section of the report that talks about a survey, or at least was purported to be a survey, and it talks about the limitations of it, but yet draws conclusions based on um, kind of a, a survey that violates the actual tenets of scientific survey research. I guess my question is, you know, oftentimes it's better if you do a bad survey to not put it in there than to put it in there and allow for results that can allow others to, to draw uh, erroneous conclusions. My, my only recommendation going forward, because I'm coming to this kind of at the 11th hour and 59th minute, is in the future to, uh, I would just recommend that, um, that, that whoever is the author of the report uses a survey research expert or someone who better understands the survey research methodology so that you can do a better job of, of doing different techniques that improve response rates so that it would allow um, for a more scientific survey to be done, which then um, you can draw some better conclusions. Yes, sir. Any other questions or comments? If not, may I entertain a motion? Be it moved that the Baltimore County 2022 <coughs> Land Preservation Parks and Recreation Plan prepared by the Department of Recreation and Parks with assistance from other county agencies be approved as proposed as an addendum to the Baltimore County Master Plan 2020. Okay, can I hear a second? Sure. All right, is there any further discussion? If not, we'll move on the motion. Um, and now that I have a, a motion and a second, we'll do a roll call of a vote. When I call your name, please say yay or nay. Mr. Avery. Yeah. Ms. German. Yeah. Mr. Heckman. Yeah. Mr. Heinel. Mr. Halipka. Yeah. Mr. Johnson. Yeah. Mr. McGinnis. Yeah. Mr. Perlow. Yeah. Ms. Panero. Yeah. Mr. Warren. Opposed. Ms. Wolfson. Yay. Yeah. Ms. Brophy. Yay. Mr. Hilton. Hitton. Mr. Haffer. A yeah. Haffer. Thank you. Thank you. Motion carries. Thank you. A report? Okay. Yeah. Madam Chair, if yes, I may, uh, while this will become an addendum to the current master plan 2020, when the new master plan is adopted, it will also then become part of master plan 2030. So it's not, it doesn't go away just because we go into a new master plan. In fact, existing community plans similarly roll forward with the new master plan. Thank you for that clarity. Ms. Bensley will now fill us in on the report from the March 9th, 2023 meeting of the Landmark Preservation Commission. Ms. Bensley. Thank you, Madam Chair. At their March 9, 2023 meeting, the Landmarks Preservation Commission voted to issue three certificates of appropriateness to the following properties. The Gallagher property, located at 703 Abel Ridge Circle in Towson. Battle Acre Park, Baltimore County Department of Recreation and Parks property, located at 3115 North Point Road in Dundalk. And the McMillan property, located at 5167 Viaduct Avenue in Relay. And that concludes the report. Thank you so much. Well, this is a conclusion of our agenda that was quick, fast, and furious, and uh, we'll reconvene for a public hearing at 5 o'clock. Do I have a motion to adjourn the meeting? Motion. Second. All Hold in on. favor? Aye. Aye. We forgot to do the council legislation. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> Go ahead, Ms. Bensley. <laughs> Bill 
seven dash 23 zoning regulations accessory apartments for the purpose of amending the definition of accessory apartment removing the requirement that the accessory apartment shall only be utilized by immediately family immediate family members removing the prohibition that an accessory apartment is prohibited without compensation and generally relating to accessory apartments and bill 9-23 zoning regulations uses permitted in the manufacturing light ml zone veterinarian offices in a planned industrial park for the purpose of permitting vet veterinarian offices and veterinarians in certain areas of the ml zone located within a planned industrial park and generally relating to veterinarian office offices and veterinarians and that concludes the report thank you Ms. Bensley. and now you can conclude <laughs> <laughs> okay now, do I have a motion to adjourn? Motion. Second? Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Thank you. We will reconvene in uh, about a little about five o'clock, about 40 minutes, 50 minutes. When you hear your name, please say aye. Mr. Avery. Aye. Ms. Brophy. Aye. Ms. German. Aye. Mr. Haffer. Aye. Mr. Heckman. Aye. Mr. Heinel. Mr. Hinton. Aye. Mr. Holipka. Aye. Mr. Johnson. Aye. Mr. McGinnis. Aye. Mr. Perlow. Ms. Panero. Aye. Mr. Warren. Aye. Ms. Wilson. Aye. Thank you all. Action and sustainability. Ms. Patricia Patty Malone is here from Venable LLC and Mr. Connor Gilligan of the CRD Golf inter, will inter, introduce the Sparrows Point Country Club, Country Club Estates growth allocation requests for the Chesapeake Bay critical area. Tonight, Mr. Paul Dennis from the Department of Environmental Protection and Sustainability is here to briefly recap the project. Mr. Ms. Malone and Mr. Gilligan are here to an answer any questions the board may have. Following Mr. Dennis's presentation, members of the public will have an opportunity to speak on the matter. First, please joining me, join me in welcoming Mr. Dennis. Good evening, Chairwoman Hafford and members of the board. I'm going to present an overview of Country Club Estates development and growth allocation request.
First, we're going to look at the depiction of the development itself. This is the entire 268-acre Sparrows Point Country Club property. And it shows the development area to the north in both. Uh, the development is in the critical area and outside the critical area, some of it. 306 total dwellings are proposed. 152 of those properties, the new dwellings, are located within the Chesapeake Bay critical area. This is a, uh, the development plan for this development has already been approved with the condition that they receive approval of growth allocation. Permanent management requirements have been met for the development and also 10% pollutant reduction has been met for all parts of the development. Um, part of the development area up there also includes continued use areas for the club itself, the pool, um, the other club facilities up there. And of course, the rest of the site, you can see the remaining 18 hole golf course proposed. Next slide. The growth allocation proposal seeks reclassification of 40.72 acres of resource conservation area to intensely developed area and 14.63 acres of the limited development area to intensely developed area. And that's the area, so the purple line outlines the actual growth allocation area, which is the portion of the critical area um, designated for those changes. But this shows you where the new intensely developed area would be on the property, a portion of the critical area on the north side. The overall site mitigation to meet all the requirements for buffer developed woodland or any other impacts are shown here. The dark green are the existing forest areas that will be retained uh, medium green, which you see up top, you know, that's developed woodland to receive enhancement planting. And the light green is where all the new reforestation will occur on the site. And the blue area, which is, it's difficult to see on the left side in the middle, that is where the shoreline enhancement is to take place to um, take care of a severely eroding shoreline. This slide depicts in red, all the critical area easements proposed to protect existing forests, develop woodland, uh, and also the planting areas. Uh, those areas are 94.99 acres. The areas in green outside, those are easements for forest buffer and forest conservation located outside the critical area. Um, currently, there are no protective easements on this property. This shows all the areas that will be um, protected with also a declaration of protective covenants, conditions, and restrictions in Baltimore County land records in perpetuity. Next slide. The growth allocation process, where we are now is after the growth allocation review committee performed their technical review and made recommendations in their February 3rd letter, recommendations to the planning board, we're currently you know, at the planning board uh, looking for a recommendation uh, at the board. The growth allocation process involved evaluation based on the evaluation objectives, uh, and middle requirements set forth in the document you see the cover page up there. Community input meeting was held January 18th at the club. Uh, Detailed findings for each evaluation objective, uh, they're included in the February 3rd, 2023 report. Regina went over those in the March 2nd planning board meeting. Right. Um, based the growth allocation review committee, their recommendation was uh, to approve the growth allocation application with the conditions listed in the February 3rd, 2023 growth allocation report. But those approval conditions included allocation of 40.72 acres of resource conservation area to intensely developed area and 14.63 acres of limited development area to intensely developed area for the Country Club of States project. Adhere to all the growth allocation request uh, plan details. Those are the large plans that came with the uh, 
document you would receive. Meet all the critical area intensity developed area standards. Complete all mitigation and community benefits outlined in the proposal, including construction of off-site kayak launches. Provide additional planted screening along Schoolhouse Cove with you know, native evergreen trees and shrubs. Uh, record critical area easements, forest buffer easements, and forest conservation easements with the protected covenants in Baltimore County land records, and permanently demarcate the easements with signs to deter future encroachment. Any questions? Board, have any questions? Okay. Now we will call upon those of you that have completed the sign up sheet in the front located in the Jefferson lobby out there. When you come up, um, you have two minutes to speak. The, um, the time will be up here. <coughs> Ms. Bensley, can you call the first speaker, please? Thank you, Madam Chair. First up, we have Rod McMillan. And Mr. McMillan, if you could speak up so the people in the back can hear. Thank you. Good afternoon. My name is Rod McMillan. I'm a twice elected Baltimore County Board of Education representative for Councilmatic District 7, which is Essex, Dundalk, Sparrows Point, Melders Island. I'm speaking today as an individual. Uh, I'm against this development. It appears to me that there's a disconnect between the planning board and the Board of Education related to school overcrowding. I'm going to share some numbers from our book that was released in February, our student count book. Dundalk High School state rated capacity is 1,447. There are currently 732 over that right now as we speak. In five years, they're projected to be 527 over. Patapsco High School, the state rated capacity is 1,334. They're currently 70, 67 over. And in five years, we're projected to be 76 still over. Spares Point High School, which these kids, the high school age kids from this community, will go to Spares Point High School. They're currently right now 871. That's the state rated capacity. They are over 275 students, and in five years, they're projected to be over 202 students. The Adequate Public Facilities Ordinance addresses this disconnect between the board and the, the planning board and the Board of Education. However, it does not provide an organized structure yet to enforce their recommendations. I taught public school for 35 years in Baltimore County, and I can tell you, the more kids you have in a building, the more the quality of the educational experience goes downward. And if any of you have been following the state of affairs in Baltimore County Public Schools and the schools across this country, we are in, if you know that, in our schools, we need all the help that we can get. And this would be a start by saying no to this development. Thank you very much. We have William Landon. Thank you. <clears throat> My name is William Lambden. I live at 33 Waterview Road on Schoolhouse Cove, directly across the Sparrows Point Country Club. The question is not whether Sparrows Point can build on this property. They're allowed to build 210 units on the 52nd acres, 57 acres as described in the 2012 rezoning approval, or the path that Country Club Estates has taken by uh, going through the PUD path which increases the number of units from 210 to 306, also increasing the acreage, including critical area buffer acreage, from 57 acres to 76 acres. It's a choice, which is better for the community? How's the, how, does the, how does this benefit community? Throughout the discussions, the design features and the benefits uh, were well described for the club. Very little time was discussed in the benefits brings to the community. Since this is a private members only leisure club, completely enclosed, the surrounding community has not been prominent in the conversation. Most of the discussions revolve around what was good for the club. What the real life effects are on the country club estates in this community. Overcrowded schools, as Mr. McMillan just went through, are a negative effect. More traffic is a negative effect. You're talking about 2,700 cars through one entrance. They lost the entrance going out to Dray Gray's Road. They only have one entrance for 306 residents. Another entrance is 
for 50 uh, private entrance into the country club and for the 50 some townhouses. But, the, but uh, they only have one entrance basically for two thirds of the population, okay? Uh, creating millions of gallons of impervious surface runoff, uh, charging the schoolhouse cove watershed each time a rain event happens. Each time this happens, we have a negative effect. Of the 76 acre site that they're proposing, 20 acres or 26% of this site is impervious surface. I know that there's mitigation factors going off on it, but they've incurred on a 300 foot buffer where part of the rules and regulations of this growth allocation is you must, shall be at least 300 foot from tidal waters. And we're not, okay? Okay, can I, can I just finish? In conclusion, approval for this proposal should be denied. The applicants have not achieved design qualities, environmental standards. There's a pond, there's a pond there that, that's on this property that has been designated as a private pond. It's fed by Bear Creek. Okay, it's fed by Bear Creek, and there's no type of stormwater management facility to, to dictate that from the creek. Okay. Okay, thank you. Okay. Here, can I, can I give you my notes now? Thank you. And um, next up, we have Jeffrey D. Weiss. <coughs> Good evening. Um, I don't have a lot of uh, hard statistics for you all. I, I'm going to speak to you from 14 years of extensive boating experience on this waterway and two plus years as a resident. Um, these programs are in place for a reason, the RCA, LDA. Um, I have watched personally this ecosystem evolve over the last 14 years and the water quality and the, the quality of the grasses and the, the bird life. We have horseshoe crabs that show up in, in late October, or sorry, late August and early September now. Things that you never would have imagined would have shown up. I don't, I don't know how many of you have spent an afternoon on Bear Creek. It is an absolutely beautiful place. Our backyard looks directly across at where this country club is. And I can say with, uh, with, with honesty that we are not interested in this, in this development, the way it's proposed. Uh, I think I have a comrade that's going to come up and speak to that exact pond that the prior gentleman was speaking to. It is tidal water. There's no doubt about it if you go out and take a look at it. Um, and so I, uh, I hope that you all will consider some of those factors in making your decision. Um, Jeffrey, you want to speak first? Next up, we have uh, Dan Worthington. I am a resident on Bear Creek. I've lived on Bear Creek since 96. I kayak probably three times a week. I was out there this afternoon and I took pictures of the tidal pond. The current going in from the high, high and low tides, I was, it was at 12, um, I'm sorry, 140 this afternoon. I was in my kayak going up to that road that goes into the Ferris Point. The current actually pushed me up against the rocks and I have a video of it on my phone if anyone wants me to upload it. My main concern is the water quality. Like the previous gentleman, um, Jeff had mentioned, in, since 96, the water has cleared up immensely. And I know I believe it was the DNR was working about 10 years ago. They were implanting grasses, and I think they've been doing so over the years. But you know, we spend our weekends in the summer. That's our vacation. And I feel like all the runoff from all of these homes is going to adversely affect that. And it looks like from the photos that most of the runoff is going to go into this, into this tidal pond, which is going to go where we spend our summers in the water, physically in the water on floats. So I'm thinking is, I didn't see anything about a containment pond. Like I'm thinking, shouldn't there be all the runoff from all the houses go to a containment pond where it's somewhat maybe filtered or just seeps through the ground where it's not just every time it rains, it's going right in. Thank you for taking the time to come. Uh, next up, we have so Connor and I are both available if there are any questions. Um, I heard anything. There's no more speakers. Those are all of our public speakers. Okay. Board members, are there any questions or comments? Mr. Avery? 
<laughs> I have the touch. Just shout. <laughs> um, Mr. Gullion, uh, you've heard, I've heard two things here today. Environmental concerns, right, still in school overcrowding. And I have a request to make, but I want you to clarify to these people that are objecting this project to address number one, how do you see the school of Accra being addressed by your project? And number two, the environmental concern, water. So those two things, if you can address those, then I have to make a request after you finish addressing those things. Thank you. Um, I state my name and address. Go ahead. Connor Gilligan. I'm the president of uh, CRD Golf LLC. Our office address is 7524 WBNA Road, Suite 101, Glen Burnie, Maryland, 21061. Um, the question about school capacity, I think, was brought up by uh, board member uh, German. Um, and my response to her would be the same response to you. Excuse me. <clears throat> When we started this project, uh, you know, there was already, you know, uh, school challenges with capacity. And right now, as part of the, the current Baltimore County fiscal year budget, they've allocated, I believe it's, uh, I don't have my notes with me, I believe it's $8 million is being allocated towards the design and, uh, and studying of both Patapsco High and Sparrows Point High, which are the two high schools that are closest to this project. So if, if, the, if the county is going to make that kind of investment on the design and planning side, subsequently behind that is going to become school construction because they're going to determine that probably a school, new school either needs to be built or one needs, an existing school needs to be approved. So if you, if you take the first part of that design and, and, uh, and, and studying and then you open up to the six-year, um, I guess, uh, commitment that almost uh, three-quarters of a billion dollars is going to be spent on school construction, Baltimore County over the next six years, one would think that you know, the county and the school board has, has identified that you know, we need to create more capacity uh, within the schools or these specific schools. Um, if you add up all the capacity of all of the, of the county schools, there's still adequate capacity for all of the kids going to schools. It's just, unfortunately, with peninsulas and, and other areas, it's hard to, to move you know, kids around from school to school. So we're forced to make decisions to know, study and either build new schools or renovate existing schools. So, so what you are saying is that whether this project is implemented or not, we are still going to have school over capacity problem. Is that what you're saying? I mean, that's already been identified now. I mean, that's why they're, they're studying the schools now is because currently you know, throughout the county with the various schools, you know, they have capacity challenges that they're trying to gain relief on. And if I um, could just add one, one thing to this. So school capacity is actually evaluated at development plan stage. So this was evaluated in 2018, 2019 when this project was coming through, and, and there was deemed to be sufficient capacity. Now this project will basically be in line so that any project that comes after this will have to pass. So I just wanted you all to be aware that that, that was considered by the county. Okay. So what about the environmental water concern by the last speaker? Sure. Um, let me just finish one more statement on the school side. Um, the, from start to finish, this project is going to be every bit of five to six years to complete. So by the time our full build-out is complete, you know, we're looking at a time frame when I, I feel very confident that there's going to be some schools that are under construction that uh, will be serving this community. Okay, the water issues concern? So the, the water issues is currently the entire project of Sparrows Point Country Club, all 270 acres, has no measures for stormwater management. So to, to contain the water and, and to clean the water, there isn't one inch of stormwater management on the entire site. So everything that hits that ground runs off into the bay. There's no containment devices. So the parking lots, the roofs, everything else runs right into the bay. The area, the Country Club Estates, is capturing all of that water. So um, someone from the community said that we're just dumping water into the pond. All of the water that's going into that pond is going through a series of stormwater management facilities. 
um, bioretention facilities, uh, submerged gravel wetland facilities. So all of the water that's going to be leaving the site, leaving the roads, leaving the houses, leaving the playgrounds are all going into a captured device, which then will be discharged into uh, the pond and then to, uh, you know, not all of it goes to the pond. There's some portions that go into the sort of deep bay uh, closer to the clubhouse. So there's a, a slide that was up there that talked about pollutant reduction. And that's, that's how developers meet that reduction is by, is by cleaning the water and capturing the water, which none of that <coughs> exists. Okay. I, have, I have a request, Madam Chair. Uh, I know you've listed everything that is for public good during this project, if it's approved. So would you please submit to us a project plan? How do you intend to implement this public good project? <coughs> do you intend to move them along concurrently with your construction? Or do you intend to do them piecemeal at your own pace? If you can send us a project plan, how step by step, not using the PMI Institute, but just step by step, how do you intend, just in case you are no longer there, we are no longer here, the county, Steve, somebody can pick up and say, hey, you are going to do this at this step, at this step, at this step. Is that too much of a burden? No, not at all. Okay. Um, but I, I'll say that as part of the, um, the PUD bill that was approved by county council, it states <clears throat> what I have, what I'm obligated to do. Uh, that's further stated in the uh, administrative law judge's um, opinion, development hearing order. Um, and lastly, as part of this process, uh, we submitted a formal letter to the county basically stating that we would be responsible to complete you know, the list of, of uh, community benefits that were required as part of the approval of the project. I understand. I'm talking about time frames, time for implementation. We don't, we don't want you to just forget about them. And we have to go to court to get you to do it. Oh, we'll be okay. Doing it like okay. Time frames. Do you intend to, to implement this public good project at your own pace or at a certain project plan, you know, uh, in schedule? Yeah, step I, I, by will, step. I will formally submit that we record plat, which is the, the first step to the, the, the construction side of this part of this process, that, you know, we will start on the per permitting for the kayak launches and anything else that we need. A county, state, or federal permit to complete, and we can start that immediately. And then once we have those permits, thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you. Other board members, does anyone have any other further questions? I just want to make a statement about this alleged school overcrowding. I mean, I've lived in that community for oh, 50 years now, and the schools are never not overcrowded. So this just seems to be um, something that continues ad infinitum. Um, the other thing I think that we should keep in mind is that I think there's an underlying assumption that everybody who lives in this community is going to send their kids to uh, Baltimore County Public Schools. I think if you look at the cost of these houses and you think about the, the people who are going to live there, I think there are going to be plenty who have the means to either homeschool their children or to send them to some of the private schools in the area. Thank you, Mr. So we, um you have, I'm sure, all kinds of agreements that you have signed or will have to sign before you can start any uh, development at all, public works agreements, all kinds of covenants and all. The county, there is a public works agreement that I would think uh, Peter would require them to do these things. They have a contract and even bonds. Don't you have to put up bonds or cash for the county yes. to pay for the stuff if he didn't do it? So I think that would be the way that you should be comfortable that it's going to happen. County requires it, or they call the bonds. Mr. Hinton, yeah, I wanted to piggyback off of the uh, the school as well. Um, I think we can all agree that overcrowding is not going. It it takes away from the educational experience. But I'm also a big believer that what improves educational experience is what's happening in the community. And I know some of the uh, the the folks that testified just now were asking a little bit more details about, you know, what, what are some of the plans that you do have specifically maybe to help improve the community or enhance it um, that could, you know, maybe give, give, give more of an experience and more reason to support this project. Um, and then kind of going back along the lines too, you know, when I think of houses on a golf course, um, what does that market look like, right? Is that a, a young family or is that a mature family that does not have kids? Maybe you can provide a little bit more insight so that we can, you know, have a, a, a more full picture of who will really be living in these homes and how that would affect our schools. 
Mr. Hinton wasn't here. So uh, Country Club Estates has various different products. We have we have smaller 20 foot wide townhomes. Fire or someone that's moving out of an apartment that wants to buy it. to you know to larger townhomes, to smaller singles, to larger single families, to villa homes that have uh, first floor masters for a targeted buyers. The, the matrix of of how the county determines school capacity based on different product doesn't really there isn't one for for no. first floor master so we have we have vill, you know villas that are all first floor master that's going to be highly unlikely that we're going to be you know generating kids from those units i mean it's a possibility but it's not targeted towards that so but we have to factor in that that's just a townhome you know no treated you know treated no different than a first time uh, townhome as well as the the larger single family homes which are more catered towards you know your empty nester or someone that just wants to live on the golf course again not someone that's going to have uh, you know lots of kids so um, do you want to just run through um, the, the public benefit aspects that and the time you spent with the community asking them what they need to get the community I don't, I don't think it's your time yes so this process started um, really started back in 2015 we had our first informal community meeting and then uh, 2017 when we made the the official submission for the uh, planned unit development we engaged with all of the area community associations um, some are specific neighborhoods that don't have a community association so there's like a an overreaching community association so we met with all of those community associations and then they listed you know some of the things that they would like to see improved in their community and the list that uh, is within the growth allocation application as well as the pattern book and I and I sent a separate slide along uh, for everybody after our first meeting identifies all of those various improvements uh, that we'll be making outside of uh, outside of country club estate are you good Mr. Are you good? any other questions from the board I do oh, you're hiding over there Beth Hi. <laughs> um, Am I correct in saying that the standard um, algorithm that the county uses to, to determine how many kids the development will, school age kids the, the development will produce was 85? Am I correct? And I thought I saw that somewhere in the book. You're talking about the results of the school impact analysis. Mm -hmm. well, the way, as, as Connor was alluding to, the way you do the analysis is you take the product type. So there are only, you know, multifamily rental or own, single family attached, single family detached. So those are the choices. They have a pupil yield factor right. based upon that, based upon the school board's experience with how many students are generated of each category from those types of units right. across the county take the, the unit types you have, you multiply it by the, the yield, and then you come out with the number of students. So Connor's point was, even though some of these would be age targeted, we still had to calculate um, the units as if they were going to produce the, the average amount of time. Or, yeah. Um, the results of it, I don't exactly remember. Um, you guys have the report. Oh, there. Bye. Yeah, that, that's a really important piece of information I think that we need to have. Again, this is just a projection, though. It just doesn't have the pattern. You don't have the full binder? Mark has the binder. Oh, but no, I mean, the full binder is all the exhibits. Yeah. That's Paul's got the. Oh, Thank you. <laughs> See, you could have left with one of these. <laughs> I'd be talking to Perry back to the car. Uh, it's, so while, right, let me just kind of move on with the point I'm trying to make. But I am, I am really curious about that number. My understanding, and my, and I stated this before my daughter's the school nurse at Spires Point Middle High and I'm a Dundalk girl I got my re wedding reception was at Spires Point Country Club so I'm really familiar with the area um, my understanding is that they, the county is looking for land to build a new middle school on the peninsula there I don't know that they have identified property for that 
yet. I think there's 1,700 kids there at the high school, the middle high school now. My, my daughter sees 100 kids a day. That's what happens in an overcrowded school. Um, but 500 of them, my understanding is 500 of them will be um, taken out of the middle high school and that whole building then will be renovated and turned back into a high school. 500, the 500 middle school kids will go into a new, a new building. And in fact, the middle school, I don't believe is overcrowded. So my concern at the last meeting, and I stated it, is that we were gonna be building a whole lot of houses and the schools, and it's, it, people are right, it, it's all over Baltimore County. Schools in Baltimore County are overcrowded, and, and there are major issues connected to that. At the last meeting, you stated that the earliest that people will be, these homes will be occupied five or six years, correct? I think that they will have another school on that peninsula, a new middle school, in a reasonable time frame so that the high school is not going to be severely overcrowded once the middle school kids are pulled out. So for me, that relieves some of my concerns about the project. Is it, did you find it? I did find the information. So if you did the calculations, now remember this was based upon, um, it was done in 2019. I think the county just came out with new pupil yield factors within the past week. So I haven't run it under the new pupil yield factors, but as of that time, this project was projected to uh, generate 85 elementary school students, 32 middle school students, and 44 high school students. That was, again, not factoring in any component of 80 students. Uh, at the time this was done, um, the only school that was overcrowded was Sparrows Point High School, and it was only 118%, which is essentially just 30%. board members too I just want to let you know that once we reconvene this meeting we're, we're going to immediately have another meeting to have any more discussion we need to have so if you, if you want to have it now you can want to have it now or if we want to have it when we go into the next phase of it Mr. Lafferty um, yeah, well, there, there, if, if there are questions for the witnesses then this is probably the, the time, That's time for that and and Chair, actually, I would also ask if Mr. Dennis could address uh, from, from EPS, if he could address some of the comments that were made, since it goes to the heart of the environmental issues that a couple of the witnesses addressed. Uh, thank you, Mr. Lafferty. Mr. Perlow, you can go first. And then, um, Mr. Dennis, if you can speak after that. I mean, I remember the county executive thing. billion dollars. I do believe that that the whole state is going to have schools and education be the priority for the next four or eight years, depending on our governor, another four years for Johnny O, you know, here in our county. I do believe that schools are being redone. You can't do every one and every year. You got Delaney and Towson. They've spoken. They found the money. They're doing that. Next, it'll be whatever other schools are needed. I don't think it's huge numbers. I understand if you work in a school, your daughter works there. I'm sure it is difficult in every you know, school at that point. Um, in today's world, I'm always concerned about all the issues that we have in schools. But I don't think that our county is not going to have a huge amount of new development. Todd asked a couple of months ago, how many lots are left in Baltimore County to build 4,000, I think was the number you all gave us. I think. So, and you've got older communities. We've become a much more diverse community and older people moving out to the city. So the numbers are high right now, but you never know when they're going to go down. And they've gone down, of course, over the years in various counties. So I don't think that these 300 homes are going to have 1,000 students or 500 students more to it. And I think that this is a Oh, go ahead, Mr. Johnson. Everybody's got to not poke so fast. Yeah, no. Go slow, it's, it's not going right. to bite. Uh, I know that you, um, 
you mentioned earlier that you initially met with all the community groups. Um, when's the last time you had a community meeting with the people? I mean, have you called a meeting with all the residents or residents in the area to kind of figure out how they feel about it versus the community group? Um, so we've had, uh, as part of this development, we've had three formal community input meetings where we host the meeting and we have a meeting. Uh, all three of those meetings have been in the main dining room of the Sparrows Point Country Club. Uh, our most recent meeting was January 16th of this year, which is part of the growth allocation processes that we need to have another community. So in addition to the three posted community input meetings, uh, we, we've also had a dozen uh, informal meetings where I've been asked to speak at, you know, an adjoining community association, or even one that's not adjoining, even one that's, you know, further away, but that was interested in the project. So. Oh. From your initial meeting to those ones that you're having now, do you find that there are changes from when you started back in 2018, I believe you said? 2017. 2017. Are, are, the dynamic, are the dynamics changing or what people essentially wanted then, do they want them now? Or? Um, are we talking about the, the residents that currently mm -hmm. live in the community? I, I find a lot of similarities throughout the entire country. Mm -hmm. um, we, we do work all up and down the East Coast. And... You know, schools, traffic, crime, safety, uh, you know, more, more money spent on existing public parks to enhance them, all seem to be, you know, they, they fluctuate from one to five, but it's usually those top five. And we're, we're finding the same thing here. So we have schools, traffic, um, environment, just because of our proximity to the Chesapeake Bay. Um, but, you know, this is our, our fifth project in the seventh district and I mean all the communities are are have similar uh, you know concerns and, and want to support the environment so that's that's a common thread amongst all of the development that happens on the side of Baltimore. One of the things I just think is my um, thank you for the um, response but one of the things I really do think that is important is that you really do hear the voice of the community what they want um, the I mean the um, environmental issues the screw the uh, the traffic issues, uh, the um, school. I just think it's very important that that's incorporated into this decision and changes need to be made or some adjustments need to be made. I think that needs to be incorporated as well. But thank you for your response. Thank you. Just to re refresh everyone's <coughs> recollection, there were some support letters that were attached to the package. Given. And actually, after I was here um, tonight from the community, he did not sign it. I think we're okay. I think. Okay, Mr. Dennis, did you want to address the, the comments from the crowd? With the, by back up with the uh, oh, the next one, the, that one. If you can go to the north side of the site there, you can see the area around that pond is all going to be planted or retained or of woodland that's enhanced. That whole area has all the required critical area buffers and the buffers outside the critical area. The critical area line is kind of at the, the southern tip of that. So that's all going to be buffered. And the other thing to remember is the 300 foot setback or buffer, the state calls it a setback, it's in our law as a buffer. That 300 foot can be reduced if there can be better water quality or habitat benefits. Um, with other measures on site. And what happens with that is you end up with an additional 20 plus acres of planting um, for the reduction of that elsewhere on site to reforest buffers that currently are not forested at all. So you improve all those buffers and get better water quality. In addition to that, any developed woodland in that 300 foot, that's an additional one-to-one -one mitigation that also is being planted on the property. So, you know, all that's taken into account for better water quality, um, in the whole area. And that whole area there is meeting all the critical area buffers and retention of the uh, woodland, and that's all going to be an easement. And you see all those light green areas around that pond are going to be reforested. Any questions about that? Reconvene for discussions and vote on this matter. Do I have a motion to adjourn the public hearing? Second? All in favor? Aye. Okay, thank you, everyone.
Thank you, speakers. All right. Good evening again. The public meeting of the Baltimore County Planning Board is now reconvened and called to order. I'm Nancy Hafford, the chair. I'll now call upon our board members. When you hear your name, please say aye. Mr. Avery. Aye. Ms. Brophy. Aye. Ms. German. Aye. Mr. Hayford. Aye. Mr. Heckman. Aye. Mr. Heinel. M Mr. Hinton. Mr. Halipka. Aye. Mr. Johnson. Aye. Mr. McGinnis. Aye. Mr. Perlow. Aye. Ms. Panero. Aye. Mr. Warren. Aye. Ms. Wolfson. Aye. Thank you. This evening we had the opportunity to discuss and then vote on the Sparrows Point Country Club, Country Club Estates growth allocation request for the Chesapeake Bay and critical area. Mr. Paul Dennis from the Department of Environmental Protection and Sustainability and representatives for the applicant are here to answer any further questions you might have before we take this vote. Now, board members, do you have any additional questions at this time for discussion? Yes. Emily? Yes. Ms. Brophy? <laughs> so, um, just quickly, I, I know we've been talking about a lot about the school board, and I know when the public school system did their um, presentation, since COVID, obviously after the 2019 study, enrollment has been showing that it's been declining. So I know the numbers just came out this week, you mentioned, um, Director Lafferty, but do we know if that number actually declined because of the decline in enrollment and the impact of this project is likely less than what happened from the study in 19? I have to admit, I've not seen the pupil yields and as uh, Ms. Malone pointed out, <clears throat> haven't done any calculations then as to whether or not the schools will be generating more. But I think uh, it, it is important to note, as Mr. Perlow referenced, that the my IPASS program has, uh, in fact, identified the crowding in that area, Dundalk Sparrows Point, and has already identified money for feasibility analysis to actually see how that overcrowding can be addressed because the population in that area certainly has grown and it's a recognition that that's an area that needs greater attention as far as adding more seats which is part of the overall my pass commitment is not just equitable distribution of resources but actually adding more seats as a priority mr warren I don't want to sound like a broken record, so I didn't speak earlier on this, but we have a national housing shortage problem. It's creating a massive dislocation of our communities. Uh, 11 million people in the United States pay more than 50% of their household income in rents. I love trees. I love birds. I love fish. I fish, I hunt, I, I love all those things, but I love humans more. So we need to build more houses. We need to think about our children and their children. Two thirds of the land mass in Baltimore County is basically undevelopable. So this is actually a parcel inside the hurdle. And we need to look at density and any way we can create more density Frankly, I would like to see more houses on this property instead of less. Uh, I'm sure I could ask the developer um, that, that they would tell you that if they could get additional density, the per lot price would go down and they could actually lower the price of the houses. So again, I know this is a broken record, but I just want to make that point. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Warren. Are there any other questions from the board? Okay, not hearing any at this time. Um, I will entertain a motion. Be it moved that the planning board recommends approval of the growth allocation request for Chesapeake Bay critical area for the Sparrows Point Country Club, Country Club Estates development. Subject to all Chesapeake Bay critical area growth allocation approval conditions listed in the growth allocation review committee findings dated February 3rd, 2023. May I have a second? Are there any further discussions on this motion? Thank you.
We now have a motion and a second, and we will do a roll call vote. When you hear your name, please say A or nay. Mr. Avery. Yeah. Ms. German. Yay. Mr. Heckman. Yay. Mr. Heinel's not here. Mr. Halitka. Yes. Mr. Johnson. Yay. Mr. McGinnis. Yay. Ms. Panero. Yeah. Mr. Warren. Yay. Ms. Wolfson. Yay. Ms. Brophy. Yay. Mr. Hinton. Mr. Hafer. Yay. Mr. Perlow. Okay. Thank you all. This motion carries. Well, this is the conclusion of our agenda. As a reminder, our next meeting will be Thursday, March 30th. There are going to be three meetings in March, um, only once in April to avoid the Passover holidays. Uh, the March 30th me meeting will mostly be viral and staff will confirm once we get closer. Board members, we really appreciate you being here. Um, it's very important, especially when it comes to matters like this. Madam Chair, the meeting will be virtual. Virtual. Not, not viral. <laughs> <laughs> we hope it's not viral. I really hope not. <laughs> we have a date for you. I've got to stop putting water in this cup. Yeah, really. <laughs> <laughs> All right. On that note, can I have a motion to adjourn the meeting? Motion. Thank you. Second. You need to come. I'm going home. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going home. <laughs> <laughs>